great pleasure to introduce uh, Tim Herkus. He's come all the way from Adelaide, so he's uh, very jet lagged, as you can see. Um, he's going to tell a story about the Beta Common uh, cytokine family. Uh, if you are interested in following this up, I think you'll recall Nick Nicola earlier in this series mentioning the special Australian uh, edition of cytokine and growth factor receptors, and uh, Tim's written rather a nice review on the, that subject uh, there. Uh, and what you'll read in that review, and I think what he's going to talk about today, is really about some basic scientific uh, discoveries that were made a long time ago, and now that they become um, clinically relevant, and uh, you're sort of, wow, how about that? So let's, wow, how about that? Mm. <laughs> Over to you, Tim. Thanks, John. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone here today, and thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm actually here today because my boss, Angel Lopez, is on holidays in Europe for six weeks. So um, I'd like to thank him as well for the opportunity. It's great to come over here. I haven't been here for a while. The last time I came was for Don's 80th, which was a few years ago now. Okay, so the area that we've been working on for many years is the Common cytokine family. Now, I must admit the title of the talk was officially GMCSF, but I expanded it uh, in title. It was always going to be in content to include all of these cytokines. So the, uh, the GMCSF R3 and R5 cytokines are the beta common cytokine family. And they are essentially regulators of hemopoiesis and immune responses. And so the classical observation is that if you incubate bone marrow cells with these cytokines, you can give rise to mature blood cells. Now this field really kicked off, uh, I think, in the 60s with Don Metcalf's work. And uh, I tried to put in the Australian and Weehi uh, components wherever I could. And I'll just point out here that GMCSF was isolated uh, first here by Tony Burgess. And multi-CSF, a lot of seminal work on that was done here at Weehi. And a lot of people in Australia were involved in the discovery of IL-5, um, particularly Colin Sanderson. Uh, now these cytokines, uh, although they uh, were initially described and grouped as CSFs, they actually do quite a lot of more than that. Um, they are pleiotropic, so they have very broad activity, so they can stimulate cell survival, proliferation, activation, differentiation, a whole, a whole range of properties. And they're very important for optimal immune response. So if you look at this, um, these cytokines also work on multiple lineages. So we, we consider them pleiotropic multi-lineage modulators. Um, R3 is the most broadly active. R5 is quite restricted. R5 essentially works on eosinophils. And GMCSF is somewhat in the middle. And you can see the range of cell types that these cytokines typically work on. And they elicit a number of different active outcomes. OK, so this is the most texty slide I've got. Uh, I apologize, it's a little hard to read. In fact, I can't even read it myself. But um, even though these cytokines, we know they're important, um, it's almost disappointing that, to some extent, they're non-essential. So in the steady state, if you eliminate their activity, you don't really have a, a, a dramatically deleterious effect. Although there are two key, key areas where these cytokines are essential. Um, one is in the production of eosinophils. If you eliminate all three cytokines, you severely reduce the number of eosinophils you have. And the other is in, uh, somewhat surprisingly, in the development of alveolar macrophages. So in this area, GMCSF is absolutely essential. And this can be shown through a number of different approaches, through genetic uh, approaches, but also, uh, interestingly, there's a, there's a problem with uh, the presence of GMCSF neutralizing autoantibodies, and all of these mechanisms can give rise to a condition known as PAP, pulmonary, pulmonary alveolar proteinosis, so much easier just to call it PAP. Uh, but other than that, GMCSF R3 and R5 have a number of different activities, and I'm only just going to really briefly touch on these today. Um, I think you could spend uh, an entire seminar dealing with some of these activities. If I start at the bottom, R5 is essentially restricted to eosinophils, so it's possibly less interesting in that respect. But GMCSF and R3 are both important in various forms of leukaemia. GMCSF also primes mature cells for their function, so for instance, neutrophil activity. Um, it's also a pro-inflammatory factor, so it stimulates inflammatory reactions. And in this respect, the ability of GMCSF to stimulate survival as well as activation is very important. Um, there's also some interesting areas where GMCSF is emerging as an important player. One is on the role of myeloid-derived suppressor cells, which can lead to immune tolerance. And uh, also I read a review recently which actually links GMCSF activity to pain perception. 
Um, IL-3 is also very important in leukaemia, and I'm going to talk a little bit today about um, its role through the ex overexpression of the IL-3 receptor. Um, it has a broad, very broad range of responsive cell types, and that's why it was initially called multi-CSF, uh, and that limited its clinical utility by itself. It has an important role in allergic inflammation through the release of a number of activators. Um, it's important for parasite ch challenge and delayed type hypersensitivity reactions. And uh, in a more diverse sense, it's also active on endothelial cells and may be responsible for um, formation of blood vessels and possibly tumor vascular genesis. So these cytokines work through uh, a family of receptors, the beta common family of receptors. And these are type 1 heterodimer receptors. Uh, they are uh, unusually, and this is an important thing to keep in mind, they're actually expressed at very low levels. So in some cells that respond very well to these cytokines, they may only have 200 copies of the receptor per cell. So unlike some receptors where you might have tens of thousands, they're composed of an alpha cytokine specific subunit, which binds ligand with a relatively low affinity. I mean, low affinity and high affinity is all relative. In this case, we call it low affinity. Uh, and even though it's quite a small receptor, it's, it's actually essential for signaling as well as binding. And then there's the, the beta common subunit, which is shared by all three cytokines and provides a, a relatively uniform high affinity binding for all cytokines. And this is the principal signaling subunit. And these uh, receptors are non-tyrosine kinase receptors, so they don't have any tyrosine kinase activity of their own, but they signal via associated jack molecules. Now, the um, beta common family of cytokine receptors is a little similar to other families of type 1 cytokine receptors where you have a common or shared signaling subunit, uh, the GP130 or the gamma common chain, and these are utilized by a number of cytokines with specific alpha subunits, and you'd be very familiar with many of these. How these receptors signal is really a very important question uh, that we are only slowly starting to understand. Um, the, the essential feature of activation of signaling in this receptor family is through activation of JAK2, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And this activation leads to classical signaling outcomes, JAKSTAT signaling. There are also other classical signaling pathways associated with these receptors, including the PI3 kinase and the MAP kinase pathways. Uh, and also, I'd just like to point out here that we know that the, even though the cytoplasmic domain of the alpha chain is very small, we, we know it's essential for signaling, and there are a number of signaling molecules that can bind. So, even though this is, this is essentially a JAK-driven event, there's, there's more complexity to that story that we're only slowly starting to understand. And I'd just like to quickly point out um, this receptor family can link into other signaling molecules, other uh, cell membrane receptor molecules, and, and signal in what you might consider a horizontal mechanism. So rather than just a, a linear vertical signaling through the GM receptor family, you can also get horizontal signaling through other receptors that bind to these uh, receptor molecules, particularly the beta chain. And I've just listed them here. So we don't really know how that fits in, but that's an important element of signaling in this family. Now, the, um, I, I guess the, the, the nub of our work is to try and understand how a cytokine brings a receptor together, the nature of that interaction, and how it delivers signaling. And this is a picture from a, a, a review that nicely shows a couple of examples of uh, ligand-induced receptor dimerization or heterodimerization, the growth hormone. Growth hormone is the archetypal cytokine receptor signaling system. It's a very simple um, homodimeric system, whereas you have the IL-6 receptor complex here, which is much bigger and louder, but at the end of the day, it still seems to re require a dimerization event, and in all cases, it leads to some sort of activation event that turns on these JAK kinases that are associated with the receptor. So, in essence, the nature of our work is try and understand this process. Oops. Now, I just thought I'd give you a brief introduction to JAK um, itself, though I realise there's a lot of work being done here, but it's just relevant to understand a little bit about what we know about JAKs. So, as you know, there are a number of... There are four members of this family. Uh, whoops. Each, each of these... Kinase is, is comprised of four, sorry, four domains. Uh, the firm, the SH2-like domain, pseudokinase and kinase domains. Now, there are structures now available for uh, at least one member of all of these uh, domains, so there is some reasonable knowledge about what those domains look like. Uh, though, to date, there is no structure for an intact jack molecule, and this is largely, I think, due to the fact that these 
proteins are very difficult to express. Although there is a, a recent study using EM which gives a very low resolution indication of what the structure might look like. And so these are some examples of the structures that came out of that work. And uh, this, is, this is free jack, so it's not bound to a receptor or lipids or anything. Um, and as you can see, there's, it's a bit hand wavy, but it does suggest that these domains are quite mobile. So one of the issues with this whole family is it's not really clear, I don't think it's known how the, receptor, the kinases get activated. Um, it does seem to involve a, an interaction between the kinase and pseudokinase domains, and the oncogenic form of JAK, V617F, is a, is a good indicator of maybe something that's important happening there. And it also it appears that the binding to the receptor is an important element of the signaling. It provides some sort of scaffolding effect and may be important for arranging the, uh, the kinase in an active form. And a paper came out recently that I'm sure many of you would have seen from Mike Waters' group in Queensland, which looks at uh, the activation of the growth hormone receptor and how Jack is activated in this system. And I've just taken some screen grabs from a, a beautiful little animation they provided in this paper. But in essence, what happens is as the ligand binds to the receptor first through site one and site two, there's a conformational change in this part of the receptor, which leads to a change in the arrangement of the transmembrane helices. And the net effect of this is to take the jacks that are associated with these sequences and, and pull them apart. So the proposed mechanism here is that in the uh, unbound state, the jack is in an inactive form through an interaction which would be in trans between the pseudokinase and kinase domains. And then when they're pulled apart, relatively simple concept, this uh, now forms a, an, a, an active form. So. That, that's one mechanism that seems to maybe potentially explain how these jacks might be activated. And I'd also just like to show you this um, outcome from another paper that came out in 2011 from Chris Garcia's group. Chris Garcia's group's been very active in studying cytokine receptors. He's got a lot of uh, structures to his credit. And this was looking at full-length GP130 and full, bound full-length JAK1 to try and get an idea of how the JAK was binding to this full-length GP130. Now, these studies were EM studies, so they, they actually used the GP130 system because its uh, unique architecture makes it quite visible and discernible under EM conditions. So using image, whoops, images such as this, which admittedly are pretty hard to work with, but once you take thousands of them and average them, you can start getting an idea of where all the bits and pieces are. The interesting thing about this is that when you bind full-length jack to the GP130, whilst you can start seeing some sort of order in the architecture above the membrane inside, it's quite a cloud. So this does suggest that in this context, the jack domains are quite mobile. And I think this is important to, to look at because at this stage, I think this is the, the best physical picture we have of what the jacks look like down to their receptor. So there's clearly quite a lot of work that needs to be done there. All right, now I'm just going to move along now into the area that's more closely associated with the work that we've been doing. And I'll be bringing in some of the other stories as we go. Um, so our interest from a number of year, years ago was to try and get this sort of picture and apply it to the beta common family of cytokines, try and understand how the beta common family were being activated. And th over the years, a number of elements of this puzzle have been put together. And I'll, first of all, I'll just introduce you to the ligands. These are the cytokines. And um, these are four alpha helical cytokine structures. They are in the short variety, so the four alpha helical cytokines can be short or long, and these are, these are short. And um, IL-5 is a little unusual in that it exists as a homodimer, and that's due to the fact from memory that this helix here is too long to fold of its own, and so somehow it's managed to find an arrangement where it can put two copies of the protein together and end up with the same, effectively the same structural arrangement. Now, the receptors, uh, the alpha chains are uh, very similar in structure to one another. They have three extracellular domains and a very short cytoplasmic sequence. Um, I've indicated here when the genes uh, for these receptors were isolated. GM receptor alpha chain was cloned here at Weehai by David Gearing. The beta chain has four uh, cytoplasmic uh, extracellular domains and uh, forming these two CRM type modules, so that's basically a situation where these two domains work together. I'll just point out this um, one of these canonical sequences that was identified in the receptors many years ago, they're called the whisk whisk motif, and I'll just show you what that looks like. And because this is the major signaling subunit, 
it has a large cytoplasmic domain that does a lot of work. Okay, so up until recently, there was one structure available for an alpha subunit, a full structure for the subunit, and this was for R5. Two groups published this structure a few years ago. And just recently, through our work, we've managed to determine structures for unligand-bound forms of the R3 receptor alpha chain and a binary complex of GMCSF bound to its alpha chain. And what you can see is the structure of these receptors are very broad, broadly similar. And they have an architecture that's uh, got different names, but wrench architecture is one of them, where basically the uh, receptor cups over the ligand, and that's how it binds. And I'm going to talk uh, in more detail about these new structures in a moment. The beta chain structure, the structure of this was solved a few years ago by Ian Young's group, uh, at ANU, uh, and this was, this was really interesting when this structure came out because it, it was an unexpected homodimer. And uh, I'll just show you a couple of key points here. Um, when we say it's homodimer, it's a very intimately associated dimer. There's no way you can imagine this dimer forms and unforms. And, and, and that's because some of these domains are formed by peptides from, or strands from both peptides. So this strand here in green forms part of this domain one from the magenta protein. So it's a very intimately associated dimer. The other thing that's interesting about it is that where it passes through the membrane is about 120 angstroms apart. So it's, it's got a big footprint on the membrane. Um, and it was, you know, it's interesting to consider, well, how does a receptor like this get activated? And I just thought I'd point out what the whiz, whiz box looks like. The whiz, whiz sequence actually forms a, a tripage zipper, and that's illustrated here. It's most prominent in the beta chain. So there's a lot of work done over the years to try and work out what this motif meant for the receptor, but it seems to be largely structural. So a few years ago, we managed to determine the structure of a, a ternary complex for the GMCSF receptor, and that is basically we made soluble forms of the alpha chain, beta chain, put it together with the ligand, and got this structure. Uh, it was quite a difficult process, but we managed to achieve it. Here's a nice picture of a crystal up here. And this complex forms through three regions of interaction. Uh, it's important just to understand the, the, the nomenclature. So site one is the interaction between GMCSF and the alpha chain. Site two is the interaction of GMCSF with the beta chain. And site three is the interaction between the alpha chain and the beta chain. Now, the arrangement and the binding of ligand to receptor in this a system is very similar to the binding of cytokines to receptors in general in this family. And these are the other members of the family. You've got the prototypal growth hormone structure over here. You've got IL-6, IL-2, and this collection of structures down here with IL-4 and IL-13 bound to the receptor complexes. In general, the way these binding interactions work is ligand binds first to the receptor shown in yellow and then binds to the magenta-shaded uh, receptor. This is often the alpha, effectively the alpha, the first binding subunit first, and then the second subunit is the signaling subunit. Though there are some variations uh, on this process you can see down here with R13. That's lost its 13, unfortunately. Uh, oh, that's four, sorry. Now, one of the interesting features that we were interested in studying at this point was understanding how GMCSF could bind to the beta chain and try and understand how GMCSF does it as well as IL-3 and IL-5. And this is through the site 2 interaction. This is the cytokine interaction with beta chain. And I think there's a little animation here which may work. There we go. So just have a quick look at this. This is pivoting around the site 2 interaction, which is centred on this... Uh, glutamate in the cytokine and it interacts with this pocket in the beta chain formed by these residues, the magenta and the green residues. Now the thing that's really interesting about this is it's a very conserved interaction and it's very important for all the cytokines. So on the side of the beta chain, um, all of these residues that we identified here are important for ligand binding. They have variable contributions. The major interaction is between this tyrosine and the glutamate. And we know that this involves the hydroxyl group of the tyrosine because even a phenylalanine is not tolerated. So there's, there's good evidence that the, the key to this interaction is the tyrosine 421 interaction with the glutamate here. And if you mutate this part of the beta chain, it affects, knocks out GMR3 and R5 interactions with beta chain. So that's a very critical interaction. On the cytokine side, we'd studied this and others had studied this over many years. 
This glutamate in GMCSF is conserved in the helix A of all beta common cytokines, a slightly different position. It's also conserved across species, uh, and its specific job is to drive that beta chain interaction. It has nothing to do with the alpha chain interaction. So that's, that's very conserved, and we and others have showed that in some cases you can actually make a mutation here which effectively completely abolishes the interaction with the beta chain and turns the resultant protein into an antagonist because it binds the alpha chain but not the beta chain. So that was something we uh, worked on a few years ago and as these other structures came out, if you look carefully, I've, I've drawn this figure to show that there's a, a structurally similar interaction occurring in all of these other cytokines in the IL-2 and IL-4 and IL-13 families. There's a conserved glutamate or, or an aspartate that seems to have the same functional role, and the, the residues that it interacts with in the receptor are, are somewhat conserved, not absolutely, but there does seem to be a, a very high degree of conservation for this architecture. Now, the, the problem with this hexamer complex was that it didn't actually necessarily, necessarily tell us, well, how does ligand binding lead to receptor activation? Uh, and that's because if you form this complex here, the hexamer, it doesn't seem to do anything to the membrane proximal and the cytoplasmic sequences. So it's very hard to understand how the JAK would become activated. And we're working on the basis of the fact that it appears that JAK is really only bound to the beta chain, not the alpha chain. And the idea is that, that's been around in the field for a long time is that you needed some sort of functional beta chain dimerization to get this, uh, this activation. And this, this structure didn't seem to answer that question. But what we observed in the crystal structure was actually a higher order complex, uh, what we call a dodecamer, which is two hexamers coming together. And this, this uh, view from above um, illustrates it, but in a cartoon form from the side, you can perhaps see what, what, what we're thinking. The hexamer alone leaves these membrane proximal domains a long way apart, but in the dodecamer, now you bring them close together. And we thought that that might be enough to activate the jack kinase and activate the receptor. And so that leads to the idea that the dodecama is the signaling form of the complex. And this dodecama uses a, a number of different interactions to form. So where sites 1, 2 and 3 are required for hexamer formation over here, 4, 5 and 6 are uh, sites that seem to form part of the dodecama complex. And we were most interested in the site 4 interaction. That was the one we had the most information on. So this is a view of the interaction surface over here. And what we did was we mutated that interface and had a look at what effect it had on, on the function of the beta chain. Um, first of all, it doesn't affect binding, which is consistent with the idea that that interface is not part of the hexamer formation, and the hexamer formation brings the alpha and beta chains together. But it does affect the signaling of the receptor, and it affects, importantly, GNCSF, IL-3 and IL-5, which suggests that all of those receptors are probably using a similar type of arrangement. So that then led us to this um, model for how we think this receptor family are activating. In terms of the overall assembly, this is, this is a very low resolution. Look at the, the whole process. But initially, the cytokine would bind to the alpha chain, which then associates with beta chain. And that gives rise to the hexamer complex. That gives rise to high affinity binding. It's possible it gives rise to signaling, but we don't know. But what we think is important is that these hexamers then assemble into these higher order complexes. It, it could be more than two copies of the hexamer. And, and the important event here is that this is a, an arrangement that could lead to jack activation and signaling. So that's how we understand these uh, receptors are, are probably working. Uh, but one of the things we want to do is try and get a better handle on this. And, and there's a couple of different ways of doing that. And the second thing I'll talk about is looking at the IL-3 receptor. But the first thing I'll talk about is that we want to get more information on the alpha chain's role in this process because in the original structure of the hexamer, we actually only had a very small part of the alpha chain. So there are three domains to this receptor, and we had one and a bit of the other. Now, you can build a model based on that positioning, but you really don't have detailed information on how the ligand binds to the alpha chain or where the alpha chain really sits. So one of the things we've done is actually gone back and generated a binary complex, a GMCSF bound to the alpha chain, and we've uh, generated a 2.8 angstrom X-ray diffraction structure from that. So this is what the structure originally looked like uh, for the alpha chain. We've now generated a full alpha chain structure, and this is what the structure looked like about 2009. So we've been working on this for quite a while. 
And now we've, we've finally finished this, so we have a complete structure for the alpha chain of GMCSF down to its ligand. And not surprisingly, it looks very similar to IL-5. And over the, over the years, another receptor in this family, IL-13, has emerged that has a very similar architecture, and it binds to its ligand in a very similar manner. If we just look at the um, beta common family, we've got GMCSF IL-5, and now through our structures for the IL-3 alpha chain, we've generated a, a homology model of how IL-3 binds to its receptor, and it's a circular argument, but of course it looks like the others. So one of the things, I'm just going to show you some of the work we've done here um, to, to characterise the interaction of cytokine with its receptor. Um, this doesn't happen after all the structural work. This was happening during the course of the structural study. So there is a, it's a very organic iterative process determining these structures. So the, the functional data feeds back into the structural work. And the, the nature of this uh, work was essentially to try and understand the interactions at this interface between the ligand and the receptor. And I'm just, there are a number of residues that are important here, and I'm just going to focus on two what I call clusters. So the, the general approach here is to basically generate mutations of the alpha chain, mutations of the ligand, and test their function. Uh, it's, a, it's a fairly straightforward rationale, but there's a lot of work involved. And so the first of these is what I call the S112 cluster. So this is a residue in the ligand that we identified 20 years ago. Uh, it's very ageing when you start digging these things up. as being very important for alpha chain binding and GMCSF function. Um, and there's, uh, there's a couple of things I want you to take from this. This is, this is a competition binding assay where you've taken wild type or mutant forms of GMCSF and used it to compete for wild type GM binding to cells expressing the alpha chain alone. And you can see that these mutations have a pronounced effect um, over two orders of magnitude. So that tells you that that residue is important for binding to the alpha chain. When you look at function, you can see some losses, but um, the, the difficulty is work with working with uh, those alpha chain interactions is once you put the beta chain there, it can mask a lot of deficiencies. So, for, in whoops, so for instance, the, the alanine mutation doesn't seem to have any effect in function, but it does have quite a clear effect on binding to alpha chain alone. So that's one of the features of this type of interaction that you need to keep in mind. The, other, the, the region of the alpha chain where the D112 seems to act is these residues here that I've shown in red. They're shown in red because when we mutate them, we effectively abolish measurable binding to the alpha chain. It's not completely abolished. When you put beta chain there, you've got above a threshold, and so you now you can see it's binding. But if you look at the function, for instance, of this double mutant here, so we think there's a charge interaction going on between this AS112 and the arginine and the lysine. And when you mutate both of those residues, you get a very dramatic effect on function. So the effect on binding would be even more than this, but we can't actually measure it because it's had a very severe effect. And now this interaction is an interaction that's only seen in human GMCSF. It's not seen in other species. And to the best of my knowledge, it's not really seen in any other cytokines. So it's an interaction that's important for human GMCSF, but for nothing else. In contrast, the other interaction I would like to just briefly mention is the, is the arginine-283 cluster. Now, this is a residue in the GMCSF receptor alpha chain. Once again, it was a residue that was identified a number of years ago as being important for GMCSF binding and function. So some of these residues were identified based on them being in a homologous position to an interaction that was known to be important in growth hormones. So the growth hormone... Um, model has been very useful at identifying residues. It hasn't necessarily told us everything about them, but it certainly pointed people in the right direction to look for important residues. And so this is a, this is a very complex reaction here, but this is the arginine-283, which clearly is getting close to GMCSF here, but uh, it's not just the arginine. There's a whole series of charged residues here which are all important for function. If you mutate any of these residues, you abolish the low affinity interaction of GMCSF with alpha chain. Um, but you don't completely abrogate that interaction, but you've just reduced it to the point where you can't see it once again. However, when you combine the, those mutants with uh, the beta chain, wild-type beta chain, and you put them into a cell that can respond, you can now measure residual interactions. But for instance, this mutation here, D231K, so a charge reversal here leads to over a 3,000-fold reduction in binding and, and function. So that's binding in terms of alpha plus beta. In terms of alpha alone... It could be 30,000, 50,000. It, it's a very severe effect. So it, it tells us this cluster is very important. We've also shown that 
the residues that, on the GMCSF side that are very important for this interaction. And so it, the arginine 283 binds to this little pocket at the end of helix D. When we mutate uh, these residues, lysine 115 and phi 119, we see a dramatic effect on, on binding. Um, in fact, the double mutant we can't see any competition for. And also we see a dramatic effect on signalling, as shown down here. So this, this residue, this cluster of interacting residues, is very important for GMCSF binding to its receptor. And uh, even more interesting, I thought at the time, was the fact that if you look at these residues, and you look at them in a number of different species, and I'll just highlight mouse, they seem to be absolutely conserved. Now, mouse and human GMCSF do not cross-react, but all the residues that we show are important for this interaction are strictly conserved in all of these um, species of GMCSF. So you would imagine that a similar interaction is occurring in, across the board for, these, um, for, for GMCSF. One of the um, benefits for us for solving this structure of the GM receptor alpha chain was that we could now go back to the original diffraction data from our hexama complex and see with a, with a much better model of the alpha chain, could we actually see the alpha chain in the hexama complex? And this would be helpful in terms of understanding how the hexama handles the alpha chain. At the moment, we don't really know what alpha chain is doing in that complex in terms of the site six interactions that form part of the dodecama because we couldn't see it. Uh, but this is what I found fascinating was the data was there, it's just that we didn't have the model to tease it out. So if you look at the original data, this is what we could see for the alpha chain, just a tiny bit of domain two. Now this is the actual data we can see and so you can see you get a much better idea of where domain two is and now we can actually see the internal domain. And so with a little bit of modelling, you can now get a good idea of where the alpha chain sits in that hexama complex. Now this data is very fresh, so we've, we haven't really finished the analysis yet, but what we're hoping is that now we can build up a much more detailed understanding of how this complex forms. Uh, at a structural level, it will give us insights into the mechanisms that are part of that assembly process. How are we going for time? Ah, excellent. Okay, so the, the last part of my talk will be a, a slightly different topic, but it's, it's, it's very much related. So, because we had this story of the dodecama being part of the gem receptor complex formation, um, one way of trying to establish if that's a common rule for these receptors, these cytokines, is try and find the equivalent structures for IL-3 or IL-5. So we've been working on the getting the hexama complex for IL-3 for some time now, and foolishly, many years ago, um, I, I thought it would actually be easy easier than the GM system because it was less glycosylated. And glycosylation was considered a bit of a, bit of a problem sometimes with these receptors. And certainly for the beta chain, it was a, a key consideration. Unfortunately, that hasn't been the case, and it's been very, very difficult. But I think, I think we are making some progress. But one of the things we've been doing along the way is trying some alternatives. Uh, you've got to be flexible sometimes to try and solve your problems. And uh, this is where I'll, I'll introduce an antibody that we've been working on. It was originally isolated in our lab. Um, I think in 1996 uh, as 7G3, and this is an antibody that binds to the R3 receptor alpha chain at the N-terminal domain, and it's a neutralising antibody, so it blocks signalling. And the reason why this became interesting was because a number of years ago it was determined that um, the alpha chain for R3, also known as CD123, is overexpressed in AML and blast cells and stem cells, and the overexpression of this molecule is associated with a poor prognosis. So at that point, um, CSL got interested in this antibody as potentially something that could target a, a molecule that's being displayed by AML cells, and AML is, is a very difficult um, disease to treat. So CSL have developed 7G3 into an antibody that's now called CSL362. And one of the features of this antibody is it's been engineered to harness the host's immune response using an ADCC system. And so if you look at, if this is the way IL-3 would typically work, um, it gives a number of outcomes. The antibody comes along as a 7G3 or, or as a CSL362, and it disrupts the formation of this complex and blocks the signalling. What CSL362 is able to do is actually target the cells expressing it that are bound by this antibody for, for death. And that's a very good treatment. And um, currently this molecule is undergoing clinical trials, I think, in the US to see how well it works in um, AML. But our interest um, was not that side of the equation, but whether or not we could get a structure of 
the antibody bound to its receptor, and I wouldn't be telling you if we didn't. So um, just, just to give you an idea, this is what, um, when we're making a, a structure, this is how we go about it. We, we express, purify the proteins. In this case, we made the IL-3 alpha chain and CSL provided the antibody. You mix them together. Gel filtration separates things on the basis of size. You get this complex. You use that in crystallization studies. You get beautiful crystals and they diffract and you're able to determine a structure. It's not that simple, but sometimes that's basically what happens. And what we, what we observed was uh, a little surprising but also incredibly informative was that in the crystal structure, we actually isolated two forms of the complex. Um, one we call open and one we call closed. Now, these complexes are essentially identical apart from a difference in this angle between the N-terminal domain and domain 2. So, imaginatively, they're called open and closed. And, and they potentially tell us um, a little bit about what this receptor can do. Uh, we, our understanding would be that these properly represent extremes that have been captured in the crystallization process of what is normally a dynamic process. Remember, there's no ligand bound here. So this is a piece of extra information that we can feed back into our understanding of how the receptor assembles. Uh, one of the uh, tasks we undertook was to try and map the binding site of the antibody on this um, structure. In red, this shows the, the footprint of the antibody. We did a lot of mutagenesis studies uh, to try and work out which of these physical contacts are actually making an important contribution to antibody binding. And that reveals the following footprint. And the size of the circles indicates which is more or less important. Uh, the interesting thing was that um, as part of this, we also looked at which of these residues were important for R3 binding. And within the, the footprint for the antibody, there was only one residue that seemed to be important for R3 binding. So there is some overlap, but there's not a great deal of overlap. So this, this, this was interesting in terms of understanding how this antibody was working. And what we've done is we've actually used that structure, which is a, a real structure for the, for the receptor, and tried to work out how R3 would bind to it. So the, the binding of R3 is a model, but the structure of the receptor is real. Both the structures are real, but the, the docking is somewhat artificial. So it, it's not 100%, but it gives you a good idea of where we think the receptor and the, anti, uh, the ligand should bind. And then, then the interesting thing is, well, how does this compare to where the antibody binds? And what this shows down here, so this is the, the two models, the R3 bound to the closed and the open forms. When you superimpose the antibody, you can see that, well, it's quite clear with the closed form of that structure that the presence of the antibody sterically occludes the binding of R3. So it's, it's pretty obvious that in this form, you can understand that R3 can't bind. But the curious thing about the open form is that it seems that both the antibody and R3 can bind simultaneously. That was a bit curious, um, because we know this antibody is inhibitory. So uh, the, the, open leave, the open structure leaves open the possibility that m maybe antibody and ligand combine simultaneously, and, and maybe they don't work. So what's the story? Um, I, I think the best way to look at this was as an opportunity, and I'll, I'll just show you briefly what we did. I don't really have time to, to really labour this point, because I... I quite like the way this panned out, and I think it's, uh, it's informative for the students that you really need to keep your, your mind open when you get observations, because things don't always pan out as you expect. And if science was as easy as we talk about it sometimes, we'd probably be out of a job. But things don't always follow a plot, so you need to keep this in mind. So I, I think this is informative, take home message. Anyway, so we, we did some uh, exploring to try and work out well, what does the open complex mean? And one of the things we determined from our modelling was that, well, there's no reason why the open form of the receptor can't form a hexameric complex with beta chain. R3 can bind here and uh, the antibody doesn't get in the way, so, you know, that, that's all fine, well and good. Excellent. So it's still not inhibiting R3. Uh, it gets really complicated visually when you look at it now, but the, the next step was to say, well, can the open form of the receptor form a dodecama complex modelled on the GMCSF system? And, and this is where we, we found something. Um, you won't be able to tell from looking at this, but what happens, one of these hexamers is filled and the other one is in a cartoon. There's actually a clash. So if the open form of the receptor exists and the antibody binds, it clashes, it doesn't form. And this is perhaps a little bit more clearly illustrated here where you have on one side in cartoon one receptor and filled, you have the other complex. And you can see these molecules are interfering with one another. So it suggests that um, 
in the open form, if the R3 receptor is using a dodecoma complex, then the antibody would still block it. So the antibody is still going to be antagonistic. So this is where the opportunity idea came in. Can we use that thought to answer the question of, well, does R3 signal through a dodecoma complex? So even though we don't have any structural data for it yet, we have a model which suggests that maybe if it does use a dodecoma complex, the antibody here could be a useful tool. And how do we, how do, we do this? Now, you know, you could, you could come up with this experiment and, and it wouldn't work because the mutations you tried just don't work. So there's possibly an element of luck sometimes, but, you know, fortune favours the brave. Perhaps this is an example of that. So what we decided to do was try and make an open form of the receptor. And we thought, the reason why we thought this probably should work is that it's known that there's an isoform of the R3 receptor alpha chain called SP2, which lacks the N-terminal domain. And even though it lacks that domain, so it's completely out of the picture, it's not even present, the receptor still works. So it doesn't work as well, but it works. And so if you look at this, the full-length version of the receptor is called SP1. SP2 looks like this, you know, very low resolution structure, and the open form maybe looks a bit like this. Um, so we knew from the structural uh, data that the closed form of the receptor probably represents the most closed this receptor can be because of a clash between these residues here, and the open form probably re represents the most open form of the receptor because of a disulfide here. But what we noted was the, the distance between the, this S196 and serine 74 changes between these two. So the idea was very simple molecular biology, make a mutant that sticks a bigger side chain in here and potentially forces that receptor to stay open. And so this is some modelling that shows that if you put a lysine there, yes, you can possibly achieve that. The caveat would be you don't actually know where the domains are going to go. So you put a bigger side chain in there, it may get pushed out of the way. You don't really know. So you've really got to do the experiment and find out. Now, you can't do this experiment with alpha chain alone because the binding affinity is so weak. Even for SP1, it's about 100 nanomole. Well, that's pretty much on the edge. And we've done this with um, uh, Barcor, which can get a bit further, uh, and we still don't see any, any, any interaction. So it's very difficult to work with. So what we did was we, um, we did the experiment in the presence of beta chain, which you'd have to do for the functional work anyway. And in this case, if you look at the wild type affinity down here for R3, it's about 0.4 nanomolar. SP2 is about 5.3. So uh, there's SP2. So that form binds about tenfold less well than that one. And then we looked at some of our mutants. There was a few more that we tested. But these mutants here, the arginine, the lysine, and the leucine, all gave a binding affinity that was very reminiscent of SP2. It's not quite the same, but you'd probably say statistically not distinguishable. So it suggests that it is binding in a bit and manner a little bit like SP2. So that, that's good. That suggests the mutation has pushed the N-terminal domain out of the way. The, uh, the next prediction from this model would be that we can show that R3 and CSL362 bind simultaneously. Now, it's very difficult to show simultaneous binding of two ligands to the one receptor, but what we can do is try and look for um, the binding of antibody and R3 to cells expressing the same receptor, and hopefully if you've done enough of it, you'll get some convincing data. So the way this experiment works is a classical competition experiment where you take R3 binding to these cells. In this case, this is cos cells expressing wild type or mutant R3 alpha chain and beta chain. You put some R3 in there that's usually binding about half maximal receptor occupancy, and then you look for competition. Whereas the wild type binding, binding of R3 to the wild type receptor is easily strongly competed for by the antibody. It doesn't touch SP2 because it doesn't have the uh, antigen binding site. And some of these mutants do, in fact, behave in an SP2-like manner, so particularly, for instance, the lysine. So in terms of competition, it's not really competing. So that, that's good. We, we tried to push this a bit further um, by using a double-labeled system, which was um, interesting and, and perhaps worthwhile. So basically what we did here was the same experiment, but now we used europium-labeled R3 and terbium-labeled CSL362. So if you just look at the competition part of the experiment, <clears throat> you can see pretty much the same effect, where the binding of wild type R3 is strongly competed by antibody, but the D196, the open mutants, isn't. Uh, at the same time as you measure that signal, the European signal for R3, or on the same cells, I should say, it has to be done sequentially, you can actually measure the terbium signal to show that when this competition is occurring or not occurring, the antibody is binding quite nicely. So it's not showing that they're binding to the same receptor, but they are binding to the same cells. So it does suggest that 
we are getting a situation like this where the receptor is in an open form, R3 combined and anti antibody combined, which is a prediction of the, of the nature of that model. Now, the, the acid test was now, well, we would expect that cells expressing that mutant receptor can still be blocked functionally from, for, for R3 signaling uh, because, and this is the model up here, so whilst the wild-type receptor works fine, the open mutants works weakly. If the antibody comes along, it completely destroys this complex, so you get no signal. Um, but what happens now is you retain the hexama complex for the open mutants, but you can't get the dodecameric complex. So we looked at the functional activity of these receptors, and, and yes, they work, which is not that surprising. So we took a half-maximal dose of ligand for these receptors and then titrated in the antibody, and the antibody still fully competes their function. And we could also show that biochemically. So over here, we look at stat signaling. The wild-type receptor is nicely blocked by the presence of antibody. So are these mutants, uh, but SP2 isn't. So the data actually suggests that um, even if there's no, not a dodecama complex formed, the data suggests that you have a hexama complex where IL-3 and antibody combine at the same time, but for signalling, you need some sort of a higher order complex that is still inhibited by the binding of antibody. And that could be, and we think is, possibly due to formation of a dodecama complex until experimentally proven. But I just think this is a good example of trying to tease out a biological answer from a system when you can't follow it from one path. Sometimes other paths come along that are very useful. And this then leads us to how we think these receptors are working. So we have uh, data showing, I've shown here that the antibody binding can clearly block formation of this hexama complex. It can also block formation of the dodecama complex. So we're, we're left with this model that R3 via a, a complex set of intermediates through a number of different binding sites gives rise to a higher order complex, possibly a comp uh, dodecama complex that's required for signaling. And down here we have our, our jacks, which we think are being brought together. The exact arrangement of that is clearly we don't know, but we think that um, possibly it's this juxtapositioning of these um, cytoplasmic domains of the beta chain through this higher order complex that allows the jacks that are associated to be brought together. And um, I would just like to leave it there and thank uh, all of the people that have done this work. There's, there's been a, a lot of people involved at our end. I'd like to particularly thank these people who've done a lot of the work. Um, it's, a lot of work's been done with Michael Parker's group at St Vincent's Institute, particularly Sophie and Tracy, and of course our CSL collaborators, Nick Wilson, Matt Hardy, and the team who have done a lot of work in developing the antibody and doing the molecular biology of how it works. And I'll be very happy to take questions now. Thank you. Um, is there any reason um, why you um, think it stops at the dodecama? Obviously, you'd imagine that you could have multiple dodecamas also. Uh, no, in theory, it could it could certainly extend, and the dodecama interaction would be defining the minimal part of that. And the other, the other thing that sort of favours uh, this sort of interaction is the fact that these receptors are supposedly not expressed uniformly over the cell surface; they tend to be clustered together. So. They are in the position to form those higher, in, higher order interactions because they're close together at the start. Well, they could go on, but there's only a couple of hundred maybe on the cell surface, so. <coughs> just, just to follow that question, I looked at sort of uh, Lumos page job or something like that to look at the, the complex that might exist or <coughs> alternatively in the chemistry and maybe like a, a capping. No, we, we haven't done that. We, so when we first got the hexama structure, we, we did actually look to see if we could find any biochemical evidence for a higher order interaction. And we, and we couldn't. Um, it, we, we maxed out. We didn't even max out at a full hexama. We, we got a partial hexama uh, by size. So probably the size of these things is a bit hard to work on. We did try some other techniques, but nothing was able to show us any evidence of those higher order interactions. So it, it may be that the crystallization was favoured that, it allowed you to see it. It's, it's quite hard to see um, in isolation. I mean, you, you do have to remember when you're working with these things that you've taken them out of their native state, you've taken away the transmembrane, 
regions, you've taken away the lipids, any other proteins that might be around. So when you have the structure from a protein in isolation, you, you have to allow a few caveats before you, you say this is exactly what's happening. But you notice the, the hexamine and the dodecamine sort of have a, quite a curvature to them. That's how we saw them. We wouldn't necessarily say that they form that same curvature on the cell surface. They may, but they don't have to because there are other forces at work on the protein structure at that point. So you found that open and close confirmation of the complex. Do you think that would somehow be due to the connecting? Like when you isolate a crystal, maybe some are on the way of becoming a close confirmation? Um, no, the way we would look at it is that the antenna domain is, is in a dynamic state. It's a flexible um, part of the protein. Um, when proteins are crystallized, it's, it's, a, it's a snapshot. So if there is a dynamic quality, sometimes it's captured and immobilised in the crystal. Other times it's, it retains its mobility and you can't determine its structure because it's, it's mobile, it doesn't give good diffraction. So our understanding, and it, it sort of makes biological sense that because it seems to have a capping role in ligand binding, where it closes over the, um, the ligand, it, it makes a lot of sense that it could be mobile and then it gets engaged once the ligand's there but we would normally expect it to be mobile. Sandra? Um, do you know how the R5 dimer impacts on the dodecamer formation? Yeah, the R5 dimer functions as a monomer. So it, the, the way it would bind, it, it's not, it doesn't get in the way of any of the other subunits. Um, others have engineered R5 to work as a monomer. So, I sort of look at R5, the R5 dimer is one of those strange uh, observations. It's one of those things, somehow, in the process of evolution, it, it, it arrives at a dimer configuration as a stable way of working, and it, it doesn't have to be a dimer, but that's just the way it suits that particular peptide. But yes, obviously, when we got these structures, we were looking at that, and it's entirely consistent with um, all of the, uh, the hexamine dodecamine structures. There's no extra interactions, there's no impedances to it. it, it fits in quite nicely. Yeah, so I'm not sure how similar this is, but the Mike Waters model is that when cytokine binds to the receptor, it sort of pulls the jacks apart inside the cell. Yep. Does that work with a dodecamo model as well? Uh, don't know, it's possible, I mean, one of the things about the growth hormone situation is, of course, that it's a preformed dimer with Jack. So something, something's got to change for the receptor to, to go from the, an inactive to an active state. It may be for these heterodimeric receptors that just bringing an alpha and beta subunit together in the right orientation and confirmation is enough to achieve a similar outcome. So I don't know. It's possible. Certainly, that's an element to the activation that we'd like to look at, and and it may be there, but we haven't looked. I don't. I don't think anyone has. Most of those studies, as far as I know, where you're looking at some sort of confirmational change, have been done on homodimeric receptors, where there seems to be sort of rotational movements and, and things like that. Um, so you mentioned the conserved residues between species for the cytokine binding. I think. Yeah. Can you do the opposite and ask what's different that's, that accounts for the lack of interspecies cross-reactivity? Um, probably, but I, I mean... <clears throat> to highlight the function for within the species, you know, function of the... Yeah, I haven't really thought about that. You, you, you probably could. I mean, the, the thing that's interesting about some of those observations is that really you only need to take make one change and you've, you could have had a hundredfold effect on on function, so um, you know it's interesting that the mouse, mouse and human retain that arginine two eighty three motif. Apparently, they you, you'd imagine they have to keep that interaction, and that's nowhere near enough to make mouse work like a human. So it doesn't take a lot to break it down. Uh, and also, if you were to look at if you look at it by binding, you've got almost no dynamic window. It's very hard once you drop the affinity below one hundred nanomolar. You've got nothing to work with. In function, you possibly could. Um, so the, the, the number of polymorphisms are that large that you could kind of keep mutating one back towards its native form. 
You would, um, yeah, you possibly could, but I mean, you know, we, we weren't that interested in trying to get to the bottom of that particular puzzle. I mean, you, you could. I did actually look at some of these mutations, work out, well, uh, is there a few mutations you could look at and compare it on mouse and human, but uh, other things other things seem to have higher priority. So it, it's not to understand the cross-species difference. It's no. more to understand within, you know, the particular cytokine receptor pair, which other sites are crucial if you... Yeah. It back to yes. Us. No, I know what you mean. I just we really haven't followed up that species. It was just one of those things I was looking at. Oh, that, that's interesting. But we haven't looked at it in great detail. With regard to the dodecahedral model and the receptor chains, I mean, put up there that uh, can horizontally signal with VEGFR uh, and UFOR. Any idea whether okay, whether this Hexamone no, or no, and just they don't interact. too wouldn't interact with a, a jack the Um, no, I'm, I don't really know much about those receptors. I just know that they've been reported to potentially interact. I mean, that's, that's one of the things we're actually quite interested in doing is trying to find out. Well, there is a number of reports of a number of different signalling systems that seem to potentially. No one really knows what the spectrum that um, possible interacting group might be. So it'd be quite interesting to have a look at that, try and find it out. But in terms of the mechanics of how the hexamidodecima complex might interact with other receptors, it's not known. And there, there is known, say, for instance, in the FC receptor gamma chain story, that it's a, it appears to be a transmembrane interaction. Um, so, you know, that, that's telling you something, and, and maybe that, that's important, but we don't know, and I, you don't even know where it is relative to the other components that are interacting with the receptor. So um, I, I just put it there as an example of there are other elements to this signaling that haven't really been looked at formally and um, are potentially interesting, explaining some of the biological properties of these cytokines. Oh, if there's no other questions, we'll uh, take